About two months late, let's talk about Tales of the Empire, as well as the comic adaptation of the first Thrawn book, and Shadow of the Sith. All of this and more on today's R2BD. Again, I have no intro. Fuck. All right. Uh, shit. Oh man. I already, I also just. I mean, I don't monetize my things anyway because I can't monetize my thing. But um, I, I just screwed any chance of monetization. Eventual monetization. Eventual monetization. Yeah. I'm fucked anyway. Whatever. This whole channel is screwed. Anyway, welcome to R2BD. <laughs> I, you can attest. I just sat here for like I think like thirty seconds straight, just like just dead silence. I was like, I can do this. I can come up with it with an intro, and I got I got nothing. <laughs> I got absolutely nothing. Welcome I back to sure, RTBD. I for sure <laughs> thought your intro might have been related to my funny mic setup. Uh, oh fuck! I should have. Okay, you know, actually, yeah. Describe for us today, brother Jacob. Uh, uh, what's your uh, uh, your mic setup is right now? So my mic setup is I have. I'm on. I'm on, not on a flat table underneath the mic. Mm -hmm. I currently have like the setup is. I, I have to clamp it to a table, so I'm using some foam to like balance the curve of underneath the table. And I have the mic like maybe not even a foot away from my face because that's the closest I can get the table to me. As as long as it works. needs must and all that. Exactly. Um, so today we're back with R2PD. Um, today we got some fun things uh, in store for you all, for you all today. Um, it's we're kind of in R2PD hell at the moment because they're releasing three Star Wars shows right in a row. So we're on the second one now. That at the time of recording this it came out well over a month ago. So it's it's just. We're all over the place. So uh, tell us uh, what we're talking about uh, show-wise, though, today, Jacob. Today, we are going to be discussing um, Tales of the Empire. Indeed, Tales of the Empire. The six shorts they released on Disney Plus for May the 4th. Um, we're also talking about the comic book Thrawn uh, by Jody Hauser, which is an adaptation of the novel Thrawn by Timothy Zahn. Um, we'll be talking about that. Um, we haven't read the novel, but we're reading the comic. because yes. we, well, we read the comic. We, we, here's, here's the thing. We decided on reading the comic before i knew that it was an adaptation of a book um i mean i knew the book already but i didn't know this this comic was an ad adaptation of that book it's a whole thing anyway and then uh, and then you chose our our book for today what was our uh, what was our book jacob a uh, shadow of the sith and i did not choose this book for any particular reason most most episodes when you ask me oh why did i pick this book i don't know i kind of just like the cover and i like the idea just of the shadow of the sith with like this with how with the age luke looked like mm, yeah i was so yeah so it's um it's a sequel era book um yeah also which... that i knew i knew that much and i was like you know what i haven't read anything sequel era mm -hmm. it's also got a just first of all, I, I i agree with you very evocative cover which i think was done by or at least had a proof of concept by the one and only uh jock of uh comic book art fame um who I'm a big fan of yeah jock actually gets credited in the afterward i think i remember reading um for, for yeah, just uh, uh, talks about like you know just the general aesthetic of the book, which I think is really awesome. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, so uh, more on that later. We're gonna actually jump into this first with Tales of the Empire, um, which I'm actually not on the right page of my notes for this. Um, <laughs> there it is. There is the one. All right. Um, Tales of the Empire. So, um, slightly. So here's the thing. First off, actually, I guess. Um, so we had talked, I think, was it our first episode or second episode of RTBD where we were like, oh, let's talk about Tales of the Jedi season two, what that eventually is going to be. And I'm not sure if this actually replaced the originally planned Tales of the Jedi season two or if this is a different project entirely. I really don't know. Either way, I, I still would, want um... I, either way, I still want a Tales of the Jedi season two, but I don't know if this is what that became. Um, I'm not sure. I got strong suspicions this started as a tales of the jedi season two mm. i think specifically maybe the the barris off you one could have could have still been a tales of the jedi thing um it's the most but naturally it's the most naturally organic one to to like chate like to pivot with mm -hmm. i mean even that actually the the morgan elizabeth one is only one third empire because the first part is in the clone war and and the third part is in the new republic so Make of that what you will, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, but uh, but yeah. So we have we have Tales of the Empire, and um, they structured it a little differently from um, uh, Tales of the Jedi season one, uh, where we uh, where that was sort of presented uh, the the Ahsoka and Dooku stories in chronological order. This rather um, uh, separates them in between the uh, two stories being told uh, between the perspective of 
Morgan Elizabeth and the second one between uh, to the perspective of Barris Offie. Um, I personally am a chronological order guy myself. I'm okay with the way they did it, but at the end of the day, when I put this in a big list in chronological order, I can't list the episodes in the right order. It's it's, it's a stupid nerd thing. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think they probably did this so that it was just easier for viewing reasons. Yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. Because think about it, most of like the Barris stuff would come first. Well, so have you, you, you would start on Elsbeth. Yeah, you'd start I with think, the Morgan one. You'd have like pretty much all of. Uh, see, here's the thing. I think the last Barish short would be like late Empire era. So I want to say that the it would go like Elsbeth, Offy, Offy, Els, Elsbeth, Offy, Elsbeth at the end. I think that's how that would go personally. Um, also, that's I don't like saying those names repeatedly in order. <laughs> in order. <laughs> yeah, but that is unfortunately not how it is. So we all kind of have to yeah. live with that fact. Yeah, um, but let's talk about the uh, the Morgan Elizabeth story, which I found fascinating. I mean, like, I so as a character that I was really excited to hear that they were going to delve into more with this, actually, because um, because I don't know, I, I it's, I mean, again, it's it, it's sort of the if you will the Thrawn problem of 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 Legends, um, because back in Legends it was all okay. Well, here's Thrawn in, in in his own trilogy, and he's like the best Imperial officer ever. If he's the best Imperial officer ever, where the fuck was he? Um, so yeah. we hear I mean, all these in stories. Legends, my, in Legends, my understanding is that was covered by him being in wild space. Yeah, yeah. So they eventually like sort of like fixed that. Um, but um, but like so so um, so now here in Tales of the Empire, we, we hear um, say in the Mandalorian and Ahsoka, we hear about like you know Morgan Elizabeth, you know was this uh, was close with Thrawn. He was uh, she was involved with um, with the Empire somehow. And here we actually get to see how, um, which I, I think is actually, I don't know, it's one of those things that I really enjoy seeing. Because, um, yeah, yeah I, I just like slotting those things in. Like, I like seeing where these characters were at. Um, once again, you know, it's it's one of those things that I really loved about Tales of the Jedi was, um, you know, seeing just where those characters were at before. So, Also, um, in the first that, episode of her story, I liked the other coven of witches, I guess. The Mountain, the mountain Clan, talking. yeah. Yeah, um, I really I, like I their them. interpretation of how to use the force. I thought that was really neat. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I kind of love. I'm, first of all, I, I love currently the big push in um in uh, in Disney Star Wars to delve into different kinds of force. Um, different, and, and, I would, and, I'm going to say different different manifestations of the force is how I would word that. Yeah, how how it sort of like permeates different parts of the galaxy. Um, so we have the Force, as it's practiced by the Jedi and the Sith and whatever. Um, there's the Mountain Clan. There's the Night Sisters. Um, also, currently, we have, um, uh, if, if you're reading High Republic things, you have, like, um, Path of the Open Hand, things like that. That's awesome. Who, who um, believe in not using the Force. Mm -hmm. And uh, and also, we have, great. currently, coming out at the time of recording, uh, we have the Acolyte coming out which has been doing some interesting things with uh, other different uh, mystical forces in the galaxy, which I think is fascinating. Um, but yeah, you have the Mountain Clan here. And again, also, I, just, I love seeing different sides of Dothamir. I, I love seeing um, uh, how it sort of manifests itself outside of, you know, Night Sisters and the sort of like subservient males of uh, of the um, the Zabraks there. Um, yeah, it's easy you to have forget this... the Night Sisters aren't the only group of like force people that live there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're cool as fuck, but they're not the only ones there. Um, they don't own the planet, um, but it's clearly what it's known for. Um, but yeah, I, I, I really, I really enjoyed seeing the Mountain Clan. I thought that was cool. Um, and of course, and also we get we got to talk about the animation though, because um, honestly, yeah, the visual I mean, highlight like, of the episode. Because like, I mean, first off, this is sort of you know this is the the newest version of what we I guess would refer to as Clone Wars animation. Which has been developing a very long way since the since 2008, since the very existence of the Clone Wars. Um, oh yeah, and is and we're now here. It is absolutely insane to see it this way. Looks amazing, and I think the one that comes out of this the best is General Motherfucking Grievous. General um, Grievous is probably oh the God. smoothest looking <laughs> character that also actually looks terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really love him. Um, he he looks great, and also yeah, it's just, it's one of those things where like I just. I, you know, I mean, we could talk for forever. I'm sure about how you know we hear all these stories about how evil and ruthless General Grievous is, and you just you just don't see that. And um, I think also this sort of being an offshoot of um of one of those very few episodes of the Clone Wars uh, massacre where um, we actually do see him being that brutal. Um, and I just I don't know. I love him here. I love how they how they portray him here. Um, I love it I just as an extension of that episode that I I absolutely adore. And um, yeah, 
Um, plus this, this plus like the first half of this episode of that of the first episode is a like really excellent showcase in showing that yeah, lightsabers are like are are like quite literally the most deadly weapon in the galaxy. Mm-hmm. But with enough, like with enough magic, uh, that that with enough magic, like literally enough magic, <laughs> you could you could fight what you could fight them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um. Also, it was cool about this, actually, because we were talking about, um, I guess, uh, Night Sisters and their weapons and all that. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, voice cast, something that I found really cool, um, was that because she's much younger here, Morgan Elizabeth is not played um, by, oh, no, I didn't par- write down the actor name. Shit. What's her name? Uh, oh, God. Vamp. 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 Uh, <laughs> um, I'll be honest. I, I, I don't know. I'm You know. You know. And, and I'm sure I've mentioned it before. The, um like on 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 our 2bd i'm not great with actor names yeah there's only <laughs> there's only so many actors i know play roles because mm-hmm. they're either just that famous or I, or i like that character really i really like the character in particular mm-hmm. um, like i could tell I you hair oh go on yeah I was just gonna say I found it. So um, uh, Diana Lee uh, Ino Santo, um, who usually plays Morgan Elizabeth in live action, um, she does not play Morgan Elizabeth in this first episode, um, but she does play shocker. Elizabeth's uh, mother, which I found really cool. Um, I think that's okay. A great I like that touch yeah. there. Um, so yeah, I mean, of course she does continue to play uh, Morgan throughout the rest of the series, and uh, and that's great. But that's cool. Yeah. So. Anyway, let's talk about uh, our, our second episode then. Uh, the first one's called Path of Fear. This is uh, the Path of Anger. Um, so, do you like the Thrawn trilogy is my question. Um, so... <laughs> I mean, I've so far liked the original Thrawn trilogy. I'm two That's out of true. three in. Yeah, two, two, bo- two of which we've covered on RTBD. Um, yeah, you can check out our coverage there. But yeah, um, I mean, shit, it, it, it's, it's all of that. Um, so, uh, so we've only recently actually seen a... a uh, Captain Pelion in uh, in the current canon, uh, he showed up in the latest season of The Mandalorian. Um, and to my okay. understanding, I think I think he's still played by the same actor here. Because um, like it's it's one of the, again it's one of those nerd moments where you just you, you see like this you know random Imperial officer quote unquote random Imperial officer talking to right. Morgan and uh, you know, and you know for a fact that Thrawn is here somewhere. You know you just think is that Captain Pelion? And it totally is. It's awesome. Um, that's a character that much like. Um, I guess much like Morgan, actually, um, the, Pelion is a character that I'll be curious to see how he was kind of here the whole time. Because for some reason, he's a character we never see in Rebels, um, but yet he's kind of in hiding, I guess, and he's still around during the time uh, time after the fall of the Empire. I feel um, like I feel like it's reasonable to assume when they were doing Rebel, when like when Star Wars was making Rebels, they didn't want to delve too heavily into the Thrawn stuff. I mean. They went as far as to do Rook, so right. But but they already paired him up with like an, with a different Imperial at that time, though. Mm-hmm. So having Peli in there is almost redundant in like the Rebels context. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Um, but but I think but it's still on that point. I get why, like from a production standpoint, he's not. Um, but I'll be curious to see um how he was kind of, how they kind of justify him being here the whole time. That's gonna be kind of fun. Um, also great to see Rook again, actually. Um, yeah, sort of test that uh that uh, Thrawn puts uh, Morgan through. And just something else I also loved in this um, was uh, seeing the creation of the TIE Defender um, from, from Rebels, actually, um, and knowing that Morgan Elizabeth created it, which actually just adds, adds that extra layer um, to her, her existence in the Empire. You know, uh, one of those, one of those um, fighters that we saw throughout Rebels um, uh, was actually her creation and uh, it sort of like makes her more a part of that universe. I think that's really cool grounds her in things that already exist it's like it's a backwards way of to, of saying oh this has always been here mm-hmm. yeah it's cool like, it's really cool star wars is really good at that though star wars is always star wars as a franchise and like every creative team in general is really good it, most creative teams in general are really good at going this idea over there this new character made it therefore we have a connection but it's backwards Mm-hmm. yeah yeah literally well it's such as such as the way with star wars um but it's fun it's really fun um of course the highlight of this episode though being um the appearance of admiral thrawn, as admiral thrawn who looks time. always looks weird in a different color outfit yeah yeah <laughs> um we, we say this with comic trades of the uh of the thrawn annotation where he is in that same outfit um 
I also like actually, I don't know if you noticed, there was a there's there was just at least a sort of an attempt to uh to make him look almost more like uh Lars Mickelson actually does is as live action Thrawn. Um, I thought I so noticed. Just the, certainly in the I build of I the character. I, I think the animation of his design. face kind of, I think the animation of his face especially makes him look more like Lars Mickelson, which is really cool. Um, it's this nice sort of like marrying of the, um, of his looks in uh, Rebels and Ahsoka. Um, it's cool. It's probably like done because, because realistically we are going to see more of him. Like, and it's probably best we start meshing the two as closely as possible. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but also, I think the Rebels thing, you know, still fits with Rebels' animation style. You know, it, it was always a slightly more stylized show. It wasn't trying to be Clone Wars or anything. No, no. But, but yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Um, I do also love the line that he enters that scene with uh, the history remembers the witches of Dothamir. Um, just always feeding into that idea that Thrawn just knows exactly who he's going, who he's going up against before he, uh, before he even attempts it. Um, it's awesome. well, I mean, even yeah. even in the comic strip, we'll get into it. Like, it's part of his whole shtick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but um, um, but yeah, then we have. Um, unless he had another thought there. I did. I just want to say one thing. Ron, this also the show that it was very clever with Thrawn, keeping him very grounded to his like established roots and what he and what he's known for now is he's already seen that the empire will fall. Yeah, yeah, literally. It's um, it's cool. He has Dude, already cool. seen the flaw. He's just waiting for it to happen. <laughs> I I always love how much this man hates the Death Star. Um, right? It's so funny. Um, <laughs> then we go into our uh, our last episode for this uh, for this first arc, uh, the Path of Hate. Um, Probably so, the most depressing episode of this yeah, whole just, season. Just, just a just a little bit. Um, because it almost gives off the idea that um, this episode especially kind of gives off the idea that um, that Morgan Elsbeth still despite having worked for the empire wasn't necessarily a bad person before the fall of the empire um it all, almost as a i, I shouldn't say bad person i, was like, I, I think I, we I, could definitely say she was a bad person <laughs> yeah but i think especially here like, like where you see more how um it was almost like she before it was almost like she was working for the empire like out of necessity you know this is this is the winning side i'm on the winning side whatever i say well um, i mean yeah working for the empire is literally just a matter of convenience for most people mm-hmm. but the path of hate i think more portrays it as like now that the empire is gone what do i actually believe in and um and when she's given the option to join what is now the quote-unquote right side you know that, that's when her beliefs are truly tested and um and she sees um she's sees what she can actually become in this uh, in, in a galaxy post empire, um, which I found really fascinating. Um, literally, given the option to um to to join the new republic, um, turning on them, destroying them, having that great parallel shot at the end with um her walking away from the fire like it was at the end of uh, uh, her first episode. Thought that was mm-hmm. awesome. Um, all, all right, down to actually um a fucking Bo Katan appearance, which I didn't expect to see. Oh, I thought that was really cool. I was so I was like that that, that amb- ambassador was she a senator? She wasn't a senator, right? Yeah, she was just I, an ambassador. I'm not sure. I forget. Um, all right down to like her telling her, "Are you it? Send the distress signal." She's almost there. You almost think she can get away, and then just d- d- sadness and depression hits you well, quite literally. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. And uh, and yeah, it's 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 great. Um. And also, yeah, again, just a great segue into um. That uh, uh that episode of the Mandalorian in season two, which I thought was uh, fantastic. So anyway, let's talk uh let's talk some bearish offy. Um of sadness and depression. Yeah, just a little bit. You know what though? This is a story that actually gets better, isn't it? <laughs> this is it's like the reverse, is, um, it's like the reverse story. Yeah, yeah. We're we're already we're already in a pretty dark place here at the start. Um with uh with the episode Devoted. So Okay. So Hmm. Yes. I okay. So devoted is is, is, is personally for me. It, it was I think for a lot of people, it's probably the best episode of this whole series. Um, devoted, I thought was fantastic. But I think one of the most interesting. It was something that you brought up that I think I kind of like talk about for a little bit was um was that Barris um is not killed by the clones during Order sixty six. Um. And we all kind of figured this, but also, I mean, like the the justification for it is, oh, you're not a Jedi, any- Jedi anymore. But you brought up to me actually after you'd watched it that um that the clones still went after Ahsoka at the end of uh, season seven. Yeah, 
I recall bringing it up as being not a plot hole. It's just probably a matter of convenience that for Clone Wars is the show to end. We need Ahsoka. We need an attempt on Ahsoka's life for her story in Rebels to make sense. Mm-hmm. But I think the way that I kind of justify that for myself, actually, is that... um Okay, so the clone's ra- reasoning for uh, for not killing Barriss is that she's not a Jedi anymore, but they still went after Ahsoka. I think that's why that arc in Clone Wars kind of calls out that the clones still respect her in the way that um that they always did before. You know, there's that scene early on in um uh what's it called, Old Friends Not Forgotten, where um where Anakin and Ahsoka are walking down that hall and like all the clones are still saluting her, and she's like, you know, they shouldn't be doing that, and he's like, no, they they still see you as one of them. Um, I think, I think that's that. Okay, we're not going to get, there. not to get into it long, but it, I feel like that doesn't matter, though, when Order 66 kicks in. It's kill the Jedi, not kill people you respect like the Jedi. No, no, no. I, 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 no, I think that's the point, is they still see them as the Jedi. They still see her as the Jedi, because she's still leading them in, into battle, the same way that the Jedi always did. Um, Barriss was and no Yars longer Oppie is literally a prisoner. Yeah. Um, so therefore, you can make that d- distinction, you know? Um that's that's my own little theory on that at least uh, but i found that really interesting anyway i, mean, I, I do like the line that clone has is like you should be glad you're not a, a jedi anymore mm-hmm. and by tomorrow yeah. morning they'll be all gone yeah um uh but yeah i i found that really interesting but then also we focus a lot on through this whole arc actually um but it's, you know for we, it starts here we focus on um the fourth sister from from uh, the obi-wan series Mm-hmm. Who's a character that I was not expecting to have as much depth as she actually ended up having, which I thought was really, really cool. Um, yeah, that was really. She's nice. kind of the one that uh, that brings um, Barris into the um, uh, in, into the Inquisitorius, um, which I thought was really cool. We get to see that castle again from um, from uh, the Obi Wan series as well, and uh, I thought that was awesome. But also, um, so first of all, we also we have um, Jason Isaacs back as uh, the Grand Inquisitor, who's always fantastic. He's always, love always him. phenomenal. Yeah, so good. Um, yeah, I did like the um the initial like sort of like test scene between uh between Barris and him, um, and then the eventual sort of rivalry that the Grand Inquisitor kind of makes between her and uh, the other I'm guessing Padawans that uh, were there with her. Um, it's, it's not all that like different than what like even in like Rise of the Red Blade kind of described. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not super different. It's just I mean. I mean, not Rise surprisingly, the... it's similar. <laughs> yeah, well, Rise of the Red Blade's idea is that, you know, there was one initial, like, sort of grand meeting between all the potential Inquisitors, and they all got inducted. And then this sort of feels like what came after, you know? Um, it's like, okay, well, you know, we still need more. Let's, you know, here are the last ones that we've rounded up. But also, you know, at this point, limited membership. So, you know, only a few of you can make it. Um, so one of the Padawans, like, tries to run off. One of them gets killed. Um... And then the last one that she's left with was it Dante or something? So like I remember like thinking that I remember thinking the name was like it was a, it was like I, a weirdly like human name. <laughs> yeah, but again, also you know the main character of Star Wars is Luke, so <laughs> there's that. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. There's that. Yeah. Um, anyway, but um, yeah, it is Dante. I just looked it up. Yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, so uh, I, I I really loved their sort of confrontation. Uh, Dante like immediately like sort of like turns on her um and you know and there's only like one lightsaber for them to use and they're sort of like fighting between it and something that i somehow completely forgot to that moment is that barris does actually have has actually already mastered like the force choke um as we already saw in clone wars and i was like oh shit that's right okay yep that guy's dead then understood that's that's how we yeah, get out that of this happened, one i was like oh right yep, she is still that's... not a good person in that yep. sense <laughs> exactly yeah there's like it's i think that's that's sort of like one of the brilliant things that this arc does as a whole for barris is that like it's showing that, like, yeah, she was never really, uh, like, yeah, she she has the capability to do these things. But also, like, most of the time, you're kind of forgetting she's a technically a bad person because she never actually believed in the Empire or the Sith or anything like that. She just didn't believe in the Jedi. Right. That's a very important distinction, too. She wasn't a very devout Jedi, but that doesn't mean she wants to be Sith. I mean, granted, I guess... It's kind of Palpatine's whole idea with the with the Inquisitors that they're not Sith because that would break the rule of two. But they, but they but they still but that's I mean the, the, this episode first episode literally ends on the whole you know Grand Inquisitor long live the Empire thing. Um, they have to believe in the Empire, and Barriss is not. It's kind of the, it's kind of the same distinction that Order sixty six makes for the clones. All, all Order sixty six says is the Jedi have betrayed the Republic, kill them. Um, Which, again, I'd it, like to point out they technically did. 
Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, the Jedi have betrayed the Republic, kill them, and but but what Order sixty six says nothing about loyalty loyalty to the, to the Empire. It's just assumed. Um, yeah. And sure, most of the clones go along with it. But what the Bad Batch beautifully goes into, and I've waxed lyrical about this before, um, is that uh, is that like you know the clones kind of realize the, the flaw in that eventually, um, rightfully so. You know, it, it, it's yeah, they they completed their task. They you know they won the war technically. What happens now? Because they signed up for the Republic, and there is no more Republic. Um, I mean, the Empire here, sure, still we could be a security force i guess but i mean like what do you want us to do <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so so again just, I, I, like this, I really like this idea for barris that um uh yeah just you know disloyalty to the jedi does not mean loyalty to the empire which i, I, just, I love, love that idea that was great um and also i mean of course you know we all love a vader appearance at the end i think that's great Actually. um yeah i i do i always love the jokes going around it's just like a vader going in to like meet his new inquisitors and like walking past barris offy no. <laughs> just like you sweating bullets inside that helmet <laughs> realistically how many inquisitors has has anakin like actually like known personally right down to like sharing even little moments with like back to red blade with like his cat yeah yeah exactly that's something that like i guess you don't think about um i mean i guess anakin would know most of them considering he's one of the most famous jedi by the end of the clone wars Mm -hmm. and now that we have confirmed that maroc is was an inquisitor here that means we have to get his whole backstory not a three-part story backstory like in tales of the jedi or tales of the empire he gets all six parts tales of maroc that's what i'm talking about tales of Um, tales of maroc and he's going to be confirmed to be uh uh uh, star killer and that's gonna be it anyway um so <laughs> our sure, second man. episode here second episode here is realization which um yeah it's just really delving into that idea that i was just talking about you know just lo- lo- disloyalty to the jedi does not mean loyalty to the, loyalty to the empire um because yeah I, I it's it's it starts off by by literally just showing how much barris still actually cares for people and still is a decent person um because she sees this uh this sort of like poverty stricken planet and is like hey um has the empire not helped these guys out and the fourth sister having been sort of like fed their lies um this whole time like just wholeheartedly yeah. believes like oh yeah no they're they're they have only been forgotten by the empire because they are loyal, loyal to the rebels and so we gotta do so once they are loyal to the empire then they will get their supplies um but we all know that's bullshit you know we all know that the emperor doesn't actually care um it's great. It's it's a great scene. Like this, this sort of um idea sort of dawn on Barrett throughout this episode. That's part of the reason Thrawn immediately sees the issue with the Empire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's great. Um, and also fucking how brutal is that scene when uh, uh the fourth sister kills that like whole like <laughs> that whole like I guess they're not like a family, but this whole like that whole house of people there. Um, I was gonna oh, call whatever. it like a meeting house of people, like whatever. Yeah, whatever the hell it is. And. Um, yeah, it's just and Barris is like with the one kid, and she's like, just don't look, walk this way. Probably, Fine. honestly, probably one of the darkest scenes that I think, like the Disney era of Star Wars has ever put to to screen. Like it's it's really fucked up. I'm surprised they didn't kill the kid at that point. Um, but it's great. It's really really great. Um, of course, we do eventually find our our um, rogue Jedi in the end, and. Um, Barris comes to her as the episode title suggests realization um because yeah she uh there, there is a weird moment here actually that i i, I at least find kind of <clears throat> i've we've talked about this i know what you're gonna say and i'm gonna tell yeah. you what i think about that so to, i guess to, to describe the scene before we go into that um it's that it's that bit where um so Barris saves the jedi and um because he's a surrender he's like listen i'll just go with you it's fine Mm-hmm. And because uh, he's, like, he's like, what? What's his line? His line is something like, "I'm tired. I'm done running." Mm-hmm. And uh, and the fourth sister says something. I forget what the, the exact dialogue is, but it's like you know we, we must deal with the Jedi, or whatever. And um, and you know, and, and Barris is like, "Oh, you still got one more." And then she fucking pushes her off the cliff. And it's like, okay, well, Barris, I'm not sure if I agree with that statement because you're not exactly a Jedi anymore, and you still aren't by the end of this, <laughs> which is a little. Odd. But uh, and my uh, just my uh, idea justification, whichever word you think best suits my what I'm about to say, is that what all Barris has known is <laughs> Jedi Order in this in this order is the Jedi Order, 
the Jedi Order is not really good, but like theoretically, like their tenets are still like good, you know. It's just that people have become blind. Mm-hmm. Prisoner, Inquisitor. Sort of around back to that first initial idea of I am not this, so I therefore must be this other thing. Mm-hmm. I I suppose. I guess at that point though, because it, it it implies, I guess between the, I mean, first there's a lot implied to have happened between this one and, and the last short. Um, but I think one of the things that I would like to see if we're going with that idea is um, Barra sort of wrestling internally with the idea that there is a third option. You know, it's not just good or bad. Um, you know, just because you're not an Inquisitor anymore doesn't mean that you're a Jedi now. Um, I would like to see her sort of come to that realization. Um, so I, I, I think, I, not to say like, oh, this needs more episodes, but it, it, I feel like, you know, we need to like see something else between this one and the last episode. Um, I would love to see Barris's journey in something mm-hmm. else. Yeah, actually, you know, great book material um, <laughs> going into uh, our last our last uh, short here, The Way Out. Because, um, yeah, you know what? I would actually love to see um, Barris become this. Oh, what did they call her in this? Wise Mother? Uh, I think that was it. Um, I would love Perfect to see her journey. Wise Mother. That. That, actually, that's a great name for a book. Let's, <laughs> let's do that. Um, let's write that book. But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I would love to see that journey. And I think you could also see her sort of um, wrestle with that idea, you know, being, being that third option, you know. Coming to that Ahsoka realization in a very similar fashion, um, you know, I am no Jedi. Find, find, find that other, that other way out. Um, I mean, because when the parents bring like their, their their kid to her to, to to the wise mother to tell her what to to figure out what is wrong with their child, because mm-hmm. they view it as something wrong, because it's still the Empire, the Imperial days. Mm-hmm. Um, they're mostly trying to hide their kid more than anything. <laughs> uh, she's Barris is like. When I was when I was young, this is what would have happened. This mm-hmm. is not what will happen now. Yeah, yeah, I did like that moment, and um, yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I really like that, and uh, I was just, I was just really like this one in, in general. I remember seeing people get pissed off for some reason that for I mean, I get the whole you know, four sister survived thing, getting pissed off about that, but also I don't get why for some pe- for some reason people thought it would be Darth Vader. Like I don't know. I don't. I, that's a bad, I don't know. Like, that's like Here's beneath him, isn't I it? Don't know, I, yeah, exactly. But I, I also don't know why people saw Vader in the trailer and thought he would be like, I don't know, like the bad guy of the series or something. Like it, it was, it was weird. People were like, "Oh man, we should have this conversation between Vader and, and Barris." And like, Barris doesn't know that dude's Anakin. He, Vader at this point in the series has wiped Anakin from his existence, so Barris means. Nothing. If he was able to push Ahsoka at the at the end of Rebel season two to the side, Barris means even less to him. Um, I, there, I know there, there is no there is no emotional confrontation to be had. Here. Um, I don't know what you want out of it, if, if that were Vader. It's su- such a weird thing to want, I think. But um, I think but I do like that it was for fourth sister makes sense. Yeah, it, it at least there's at least a genuine emotional payoff you can have there. Um. Especially if your story is this, because I really love where they go with this. Um, so basically, Barris sends uh, the family and their child, uh, four sensitive child, importantly, uh, through this uh, ice cave. Oh, and her aides. She has like two of them. Mm-hmm. The two people who believe um, in her, I should say. Yeah. And so they, they, she sends them through this sort of like mystical, magical force cave uh, where like only they, they'll be able to like find their way out pretty much. And so. And then leave, like, just leave me behind. I'm, I'm as good as dead. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And so then the fourth sister comes along and confronts Barris, and they go inside the ice cave, and the fourth sister cannot find her way out. And it's it, it's it's all a metaphor, and it's cool and fun and whatever. But I really love where this ends because it, easily my, my favorite line of this whole episode was the whole um you know it, it's um it's when like fourth sister is like looking around and she's like trying to trying to find Barris, and she says, like, there's no way out, and Barris's response is, that's what the Empire wants you to think. Because, um, again, I, 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 think, I, I think that's just a wonderful metaphor for Barris's journey as a whole. Um, and I think for a lot of characters that are sort of um, within the Empire's grasp, and actually, once again, a great parallel with the Morgan Elizabeth story here, like, you know, someone that has fully given into that um, that idea that, like, once you're in there, you know, you're, you're kind of in there. You know, this this is this is what the galaxy is now. You better be part of the Empire. Um, 
but no, there is there is a way out. There is that third option. Um, and uh, and the way out in this case is forgiveness, which I fucking love. I think that's a great yeah for message to have is, there. Um, that is the best message that the fourth sister and Barris need to need for each other. Mm-hmm. And in and and in and in like the fourth sister sort of like lashing out and uh, rampaging. She kills Barris, uh, seemingly by accident. Um, and it's that regret that she feels in that moment that allows her to begin to see the way out and eventually get out, as we see in the end there. Um, fucking brilliant. Oh my god, I, I was, love that last I love that last that episode so much. La- that was such a great it's, way. It's such to, a good last end, episode. End the Barris story. Presumably she's just dead. Yeah, I, I, would, I would assume so. Um, but yeah, I just, oh man, I love that. Love, love, love that. The only reason I could see her not being dead is if it's like the catalyst for a book where we do like sort of the follow that up with flashbacks to how she became the wise mother. That's possible. I, I, I personally would prefer this to be the actual end of her character. Though. I, I feel like it makes I sense. I agree. I think it would make the most sense, but that is just one possibility just off the top of my head. I think what's more likely if we're talking like flashbacks in a potential like wise mother book, um, I think I'd rather see flashbacks to her time as an inquisitor. Um, also her turn to uh, her, her turn away from the Jedi initially in the clone wars. Um, I think that would be cool to see. That'd be interesting. I mean, I'm down for either idea of a book is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. But um, that was tales of the empire. And, uh, and I, I just I I really enjoyed that. I heard, I think I think overall I enjoyed Tales of the Jedi just a little more. Um but I think also you know that, that, that's more like I think there's just a stronger foundation for a character like Count Dooku to explore his story. Um and Dooku of course like being I think you know I think we both agree like probably the best thing about Tales of the Jedi. Um yeah. But also I th- I think doing Tales of the Empire as sort of the follow up to ta- to 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 Tales of the Jedi. I'm saying this too many times in a row. Um, I think also leaves the door open for future potential tales of series. Uh, my initial idea was Tales of the First Order. I would love to see. Yes, um, I, I remember we talked about. That. I was like, okay, that is not the, maybe the next obvious choice, but that is the one I would definitely go. Yeah, that please. I would love to see some more sequel era things in the Clone Wars animation style, like we be, like we started to see here in the in the last Morgan Elsbeth short. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, do a first order one. Give me like some Captain Phasma backstory. Give me Snoke. Give me Hux. Um, do a whole Ben Solo thing. Give me anything. I would love it. Uh, Listen, awesome. Like people will, people will watch and they will generally enjoy. I assume. I would hope so. I would certainly hope so. People seem to um still really enjoy this, and uh, I would hope they continue to do so in the future. Um, but anyway, let's get into our our comic for today. This is Thrawn by Jody Hauser slash Timothy Zahn. So here's the thing. Okay. I think this is unfortunately the most negative we have to be uh, on this series so far. Um, yeah, unfortunately. Almost just more by default, more than anything. Yeah, because I'm, I'm just, I'm just, mm. Here's the thing. I want to say it's because I di- didn't read the book, but I, I don't think I had to, to really have the problem that I had with this um because the story is good i think the story is very good i do like the base story being told here Mm -hmm. it's a very book story isn't it yes it is fortunately not the proper medium Mm -hmm. i just like i mean yeah you know give me thrawn comics all you want i just would rather a story that was you know meant to be told through the medium of comics um when clearly this isn't you know is timothy zahn wrote a a high stakes political drama with the occasional action scene. And I'm telling you, man, that's just not a comic book. I, I don't think at least. <laughs> um, it's very wordy. Like, yeah, I don't think it translates just particularly... flip to any, like if you just flip to any random page, there's so much dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, it, <laughs> I guess that kind of makes it sound like, Oh yeah, we, we like, we just didn't want to read. Um, but no, I mean, I think I've talked a lot with my, my, my other good friend, Jacob Licklider on fresh face comics about there's this, there's this sort of balance you need to strike in in picture to word in the picture to word ratio in a comic book um, in order to like keep up the pacing of your story, um, but through both dialogue, action, 
whatever other scenes that you could do like through, through visuals um you need to be able to strike this balance and because it's adapting a book and books are very wordy and potentially very dialogue heavy that just it, it just kind of gets all lumped into this comic that kind of suffers for it but again the story is good i can recognize it's a good story that i'm reading i imagine the book is fantastic i just don't think it's anything that could really be elevated or adapted in an interesting way into a comic um, and Judy Hauser does what she can, but I can't help but also feel like she wasn't given much creative license when adapting this into a comic. No, I feel that way too. Like, honestly, I think the most, it seems to me, and again, this is having not read the book, um, but it seems to me like almost like the most creative license she got was to like, whenever they're talking about a different character to just kind of throw a big splash page in there <laughs> of uh, of whatever, whoever the hell they're talking about. So like, there's a scene early on where like, um the emperor and thrawn are talking about anakin skywalker and there's just was, big, that was one of the first big silhouette of darth of. vader like that and the, the one at the end where um where governor price is talking to thrawn about oh i'm dealing with a rebel cell giant splash page of the rebels from season three it's like all right sure you do you i guess um it's it, it, it's just i don't know i feel like i don't know either there needed to be significantly more creative freedom or crazy idea just write an original Thrawn comic, maybe. <laughs> like, I don't know. That becomes an issue, though, wherein, where I would assume anything made under Disney canon all has to main can- all has to remain canon. Generally, eh, I mean, there is like there is like isn't there like um a Kanan Jarrus comic that is that has been like kind of decanonized by the existence, existence of Bad of, Batch? I know of two pieces of Disney Star Wars canon that are no longer canon. Okay. That one, and I've heard the Ahsoka book is no longer completely canon because of. Well, see, here's, here's the thing. So as far as I know, they're still counted as canon, but I think like differing accounts, something like that. I'm not sure. I know. I know for some reason the Ahsoka book is still kind of counted as canon. I'm not sure. It's we, weird. But we all know that visual media always comes first. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um. But again, canon's weird. Canon is 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 weird. Um, it never really exactly lines up the way you want it to, um, and you just kind of have to accept these things with giant sprawling sci-fi franchises like Star Wars and especially something like Doctor Who. But that's a totally other topic. Um, a different thing, tangentially related. <laughs> we're mostly that, that, that is most of our basis for dealing with this conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Um, but actually talking about it, I mean, again, it's a good story. If I were just describing the story, it's really, really good. Um, I love the way it opens. Uh, I, I thought, so here's the thing. I love my first couple of notes here. My first notes are funny. Oh, what are they? Um, so my first three notes are um, talking about the Chiss. The Chiss are warriors. Just kind of noting that down for myself. Um, I have Clone Wars flashback is my second one. You can already see the flaw here. My third one is, um, I wrote down Thrawn's full name, which I will now try to butcher. Um, Myth, myth, Mithron Uru Uru Odo, Mithron Uru Odo. I think is how you pronounce it. Um, I'm not. Mithron, I'm not going to try to repeat that. Essentially, my third note is Thrawn captured by Republic, but then I have crossed out Republic and <laughs> turned it into Empire. I kind of thought the opening was a Clone Wars thing, um, which I realized was kind of dumb. But I, I only thought it because there were clones here. But then also remembered that hey, clones still existed early on in the Empire. So there's that. Um, we literally it was just watched a show about it. Yeah, look, I, I I see clones. I think Clone Wars. You really can't blame me for that. That's I kind of their whole you. deal. Yeah. So I don't blame anyway, um, but I did love the way it's open. I thought that was really cool. Um, also, just showing that Thrawn has kind of always been this master manipulator, like even from before he was part of the Empire, um, because his plan always sort of involved becoming part of the Empire um and using as it to is, his game as is described by the end of the story everything done minus being given the rank of at grand admiral and and mm-hmm. and under has been yeah. part of his plan <laughs> yeah pretty much pretty much um i do know that there's like so there are like two trilogies of current canon thrawn books yeah um, and they 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 interest me but in a way that confounds me yeah yeah <laughs> um but uh but no i mean like so so there's like there's this one there's um the second one is called thrawn alliances i think i want to say i think um called alliances and uh i know for a fact i i know that's like that's the one that sort of like delves into um i think whatever happened after this first book but also kind of 
um what Thrawn's whole deal was with um the flashbacks uh uh it it has flashbacks to uh, him and Anakin during the Clone Wars, um, which I find really interesting. I just want to point out we do know what happened to Thrawn after this first book. It's the splash page. It's the it's splash. The it's, it's, yeah, it's Rebels. Um, although again, I, I I think there's there's still for some reason more stuff that happens in there. Um, I think okay. So looking at it, it looks like chronologically, this is the second of the Thrawn trilogy. The, the, sorry, this is the second Thrawn trilogy, I should say. Um, like if we were reading them in order, this that other one would come first. I think so. So it looks like... Huh, okay. So it looks like there's this one, there's alliances, and then the last one's called Treason. I think. Yeah. So, so it's, 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 there's three of them, and then there's one, then the other trilogy is called the Thrawn Ascendancy Trilogy. Um, one of which... That we just read his Ascendance. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, there's the whole thing in this called the Ascendancy, the Chiss Ascendancy. But, like, okay, so there's one that takes place during the Clone Wars called Chaos Rising. And then there are two that are still post-Revenge of the Sith that are still before this first Thrawn book, which I'm not sure how that happens, called Greater Good and Lesser Evil. Oh, that's ooh, this sounds all time. All it like, sounds incredibly confusing, doesn't it? <laughs> this is this is what happens when you remove Thrawn before the first Death Star is destroyed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's not it's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, do what you do, I guess. But whatever. It only has so anyway. much time to be part of the Empire, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, let's talk about this though. Actually, let's get let's get back into no, this. Let's actually um, talk about the, the plot. Yeah. Let's talk about um uh, Eli Vanto, who's sort of our our. I, again, it's another one of those very book things, right? I imagine Eli, Eli is actually our um, our sort of like perspective character for most of the book. Um, I would assume but here, so. But here he just kind of like takes over the, the narrator sort of position. Um, and again, which is very wordy and just kind of throws off the pacing of the book, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, Thrawn sort of like gets this, uh, this assistant assigned to him in, in the form of Eli Vanto. Um, Thrawn is... Uh, <laughs> I love kind of like... And again, this is covering like a large span of Thrawn's life, it seems like. Um, but like Thrawn consistently like is just getting continuously uh, uh, ba- uh, bumped up in, in ranks in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Empire. Um, and uh, why do I have this noted here? It could be. OK, so for those watching, um, for those watching, usually there are long breaks between episode recordings of R2BD, obviously. But obviously. for this. For this, we also had to take a longer break between actually finishing the things we read and watched for this and recording because life things happened. It, it's, it's, it's a personal thing. Anyway, um, but so there's been some distance, but I really have to wonder, and I, there's got to be a good reason for it. I have Kobayashi Maru written in my notes here. Kobayashi <laughs> Maru. Which is the... Um, What's the note before it? uh thrawn rank reveal and kobayashi maru is what i have here rank reveal that's when he gets the rank given to him is is there is there like a, a kobayashi maru thing in here it's like hang on i'm just flipping through the first little bit of the, 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 the trade the the the, 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 the no win scenario from star Trek. oh like, is this... oh is that referring to when he's attacked in the card okay. game okay yep okay i think so yep I th- yep okay you're right. There's a scene like in what the first issue, maybe the second one, it's where him and one. uh, him and his buddy are invited to a card game and they're trying to fuck with them by going, "What if I had these cards?" And Thrawn goes, mm-hmm. "Okay, but what if I also had those same cards?" Yeah okay yep that is exactly the scene I have I was thinking of here because then right after I have noted the uh, the attack after the card game. Okay yep that is absolutely right. Thrawn is just pointing out there is no such thing as a no lose. A no win no- scenario. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, especially when Thrawn is at is at the command, which actually is even cooler. I, I know, obviously, you know, Zahn didn't really know what they would be doing with the character um, at the time that he wrote this, because this was written I think, not long after he first appeared in Rebels. Um, but I obviously didn't know. But also, kind of makes the fact that he's still lost at the end of Rebels even cooler, because he still had a plan, even where him and Ezra took him, like even where even going where Ezra took him um i think that's really cool you know just like Mm. there's there's no way for thrawn to lose no matter what i mean obviously he has to eventually 
but he has I'm to curious. lose eventually. But I like to put out Thrawn has never technically lost. He's only just nope. been set back. Yeah. Yep. The entire time we've known him. <laughs> yep. Oh, it's so good. Oh, what a great character. Fucking hell. Um anyway. I just like the whole thing where like early on at least Vanto is really like consistently trying to get away from Thrawn. <laughs> and, right? Uh, like Thrawn he just kind of for... he doesn't hate him. He just hates that like he's he's immediately like in Thrawn's shadow the entire time. He's not even needed to be Thrawn's aide after like he learns basic. Mm -hmm. After that, he, is... he, he Eli does not need to be there. He, and he's mm -hmm. like he's like pissed about that in most of this book. Yeah, yeah. Um it is also then I think in this like second issue here where we meet um Signy, who um who sort of becomes I would say at least like, sort of like our primary antagonist for this uh for this story. Um who ended up being a kind of a cool character, though not one that I could get like especially attached to, um, but a cool villain, a good like foil for Thrawn, I think. Um, someone who, much like him, kind of just like keeps coming back. I thought he was an interesting foil for Thrawn because it almost seems like he shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I mean, and Thrawn eventually reveals that like he wants to use him because he's cunning, he is clever, and he's the kind of person that Thrawn would use in a very personal sense. Yeah, because he doesn't want him in the Empire. He just, as Thrawn says, he he won't, he can't be in the Empire. He has too much of a of a of a, of a rap sheet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, like, it's like I'm actually glad you brought that up because there's sort of also that idea that um, like Thrawn is also fighting an uphill battle against Imperial racism because, I mean, again, I don't know if you guys noticed this, the Empire is almost entirely humans, um, white humans, but that's kind of kind of beside the point. Um, the Empire is almost entirely humans, and um, and so there's this guy, this Chiss, this blue man, trying to work his way up in the ranks of the Empire, and he faces adversity for that, which I find really interesting. I thought that was a great aspect of the Empire that I, I like that Thrawn, that, that Timothy Zahn sort of tapped into. Um, and it feels bad that I'm also crediting Timothy Zahn for all these great things, but again, it just I, to me at least, and again, it could be because I didn't read the book, um, but it doesn't feel like Jody Hauser like made up any of these any of these plot points herself because i mean again she didn't and i'm not discrediting J jody hauser i've read a bunch of her stuff she's a really great writer um but again she literally didn't make up this story herself and uh, she's doing a, an okay job executing it but is kind of bogged down by what the book is and what the book has to be and what it has to be is not a comic um right like but the fact it has to that. have <laughs> big splashes of art everywhere just to get across like just to get, like, I'm just looking at a random page from issue two where it's Eli and he's, like, looking real pissed off in the bottom right corner. Uh, like, that face has to get across whatever kind of internal thoughts are being said on the book. Yeah. And it's no? tough. Like, it's just, I don't know. It, it just, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it, Judy Hauser was given a, a, a difficult task. Um, and I, just, I, it's, I, I don't really blame her for, for my own personal issue. Um, because I gotta be honest, then a solid chunk of the book before we met, like Price, then after this moment, like, kind of became a slog for me. Um, and it was pretty oh, early on already. It was, it was a bit of a slog, which is an issue. But I guess, I guess we could have had, I guess we could have worse issues. Yeah, yeah. Um. I did like this, uh, although I, I want to talk about, um, I think it's the end of issue two here that I have noted, um, where uh, Eli Vanto is offered a promotion um, and is, and, and it's pretty much like offered it on that sort of like imperial racism sort of uh, topic. He's like, he's, he's being offered it because they, uh, because the empire like sort of like realizes like what the threat that Thrawn poses and they kind of like want to take away as much of his power as they can. And Vanto is part of that. Um, which is really cool. And Vanta sort of realizes that. And while he is actually tempted by the promotion offer, like he declines it because like on principle of like why he's being offered it, which I found really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I cool. really thought he was like, he was probably the more most interesting character. No, on the front is on all the other characters aren't interesting. I did really like him. And the personal story he goes through is very good. I liked it. Mm -hmm. like, especially at that point. He's yeah. like, He's given the opportunity to leave the like, Imperial Navy and then eventually rejoin the ranks higher. Mm -hmm. But he's like, no, I see what's going on here, what political games are being played, and Thrawn does not deserve this. Yeah, yeah. 
Anyway, um, let's get into Governor Price, though, um, who is a character that I was not expecting to play as big a role in this as I thought she would. Um, I'd love to know what kind of hard shift the book takes, though, to make this make sense. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I like, is it spring? Is it is it more sprinkled as compared to being all one issue? I'd like to think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is a great issue, though. Um, uh, you, Governor Price's backstory, um, how she was uh, sort of involved not even really with the empire directly at first. Um, and it was more her like family that, um, and what happened with them that got her involved. Um, this is also where we actually start to see um, some like larger Imperial faces throughout the book. Um, we see first off, uh, uh, Admiral Yularen, or is he an Admiral anymore? I forget what rank he is actually at this point. Um, yeah, I don't know. Whatever. Anyway. I happen to be on a page with him and you could keep, you, you can keep talking. I'll, I'll correct. I'll let you know in a second. Mm, okay. Um, but yeah, I, I like I like seeing Yularen. I think colonel. He's, also, he's a colonel, colonel, colonel Yularen. There we go. Um, who actually is also a character that he, I remember back when I read um, the uh, the Tarkin novel. Uh, he appeared in that as well. So I, I, I kind of like seeing like I, I, Tarkin also. I, I, not Tarkin. Um, Yularen is also one of those characters because we talked about it during our Tales of the Empire discussion just now. Um, another character that just sort of naturally got folded into the empire and just kind of like kept doing his job because the empire was the ruling government in the galaxy now. So he would just kind of folded in with that. So I always like that take on his character. Um, I think it's also the point of the book where we start to see a uh, Tarkin a little bit um, and see like Price's involvement with involvement with, uh, with her. Cause you get the idea that like, you know, the, the existence of rebels as a, as a show was on the horizon here um, starting to come about. And uh, you're starting to see these connections being made. It's cool. I like what Zahn does with it. Um, uh-huh. And maybe... It's very smart. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's a very smart way to do this in, like, when it was being written. And then as, 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 comp- as in comparison to the show's release schedule and the book's release. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But also, like, it does also make me wonder if, um, if like, Zahn had no clue he was going to get, like, a trilogy, let alone two at first. Because like it feels like he wants to cover the entirety of Grand Admiral Thrawn's history pre Rebels in this one book, um, and uh, and then kind of realize later, oh yeah, he could kind of like split that up, and he's Timothy Zahn, so they'll let him do whatever he wants. Um, <laughs> Man has so much control over like lore, and I don't get it. Yeah, well, well, here's the thing: he did back in Legends, and nowadays. Because he had that much control, he's kind of respected just as much these days, um, but not with not near as much control. But they'll still let him do whatever he wants. Sort of. He was um, grandfathered into the into Disney canon, uh, but yeah. he now has a, a little more oversight than Lucasfilm Publishing, right? Would have had. Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah Lucasfilm. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, I did like the the part of like Price's backstory where she was involved with that um that one adv- advocacy adv- advocacy group, um, higher mm. skies they're called, and uh, sort of like works to take them down. Um, because they're also kind of dicks. It's fun. Um, I mean, like it's Star Wars. Wars. What group that's around and wants power isn't besides yeah. the besides the New Republic, of course. They're all lovely humans who do nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. Lovely creatures, <laughs> I should say. Yeah. Um. Yeah, then uh, I don't know, kind of, kind of like going through the rest of this. Then um, we get this, uh, get this great plotline of like Thrawn like looking into Imperial traitors because of course they're Imperial traitors. Um, Thrawn continuously going up in rank is another thing I have noted here. Um, the Emperor is also mad at Thrawn because you know Thrawn is actually kind of, for lack of a better phrase, rebellious uh, in in the way he goes about his uh, Imperial dealings. Doesn't um, seem to care for the the day to day protocol of getting shit done. Yeah, yeah, but he still gets shit done. Um, actually, gets shit done. Not in the uh, not in the paperwork uh, uh, imperial way. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, oh, another note I have here again: just the ranks, the ranking ups are continuous. But also, we do finally get a a promotion for Vanto here as lieutenant commander. Um, and then there's Commodore Thrawn, which I think is a great uh, uh, title for Thrawn. I think is and unfor- I, I, I just, unfortunately, and unfortunately for just Eli Vanto, his his rank ups are almost exclusively just so that he could constantly be next to Thrawn still. Mm-hmm. Just enough in- under him so that he could still be involved in his shit. Yeah. Um, like his promotions only make sense in relation to Thrawn's promotions. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Um, oh, yeah. Oh, this is also the point of the book where we get uh, Thrawn gets the uh, the Chimera, um, which is awesome. We see him get that ship. Um, then he's then he becomes Admiral Thrawn. Um, I have oh, what's the book? I have in my notes here Vanto uh, disguised. What is that bit? Oh, that's when he's going to to meet the rebels under the disguise of like being an arms dealer mm. oh that's right and he finds out about signy there right okay yeah i think that's I think that's right yeah that's exactly um, what that is tell us about that point in the book where we learned that um that signy like kind of knows about thrawn's uh past uh, uh excursions with anakin skywalker during the clone wars which is kind of fun because again signy is just this kind of like great foil for thrawn throughout the book um that's fun uh we get some bits of like thrawn and price working together um uh, Thrawn says of a meeting with Signy. I'm just kind of going through my notes now at this point because uh, I didn't that's love because yeah, I didn't no, love totally the back fair, half of the because I didn't love the back half of this comic. I really didn't. Oh, man. The biggest thing here is that Thrawn tries to get um, how do you say his name? Signy. Signy. That's how I, Signy. I was saying it at least. Um, tries to get him to do his like chiss dirty work because Thrawn still has the ultimate goal, at least in the book here in the comic, of. Seeing the Empire essentially fall to prove that the Chiss will never have to deal with them. <laughs> mm-hmm. At least that's yeah. how it looks in this book. That seems to be his goal. Mm-hmm. I think. I think as far as like the Chiss and their like larger involvement in this, that's something that we need. We need to like sort of get into with the other books, I suppose. Um, I know they did adapt the second book into a comic, but honestly, I think at this point, I'm just kind of more interested in uh going through the, the actual books, books at this point yeah so, that's absolutely yeah. what i would do personally yeah but we However, are still in the we are still in the middle of a totally different thrawn trilogy at the moment so right however through his conversation with signy is we they both learned that they're both very interested in something called a in what was a project stardust oh uh, yeah just a little bit that, that, that small thing that we might have heard of once or twice yeah and Thrawn is like, I've heard of this too. If we put our resources together, and Signy's like, how about I still think you're the greater evil in between the two of us? Mm-hmm. Um, and Thrawn's like, yeah. all right. That's for all right. of you then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, we, we, I think it's also like around the point of the book where we get the whole um, like Thrawn like, tricked the Empire into hiring him, basically. Um, yeah, and that, like, which his, uh, I really loved. He says, like, oh, I made the camp look like I was there for, like, years. It's been, like, maybe a month. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Fucking, I love this guy so much. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so these guys get killed. Um, uh, Price gets... I love my one note here. Price gets Thrawn involved with rebels. And, and as if I, that could be confused with, um, you know, Thrawn being a rebel himself, I put rebels, parentheses, 2014. Um, <laughs> so, so, I like that. That's, so that. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we have a uh, the Grand Admiral Thrawn uh, uh, rank rank finally. Um, we have a nice fun little like Vader cameo at the end. Um, full uh, rebels regularly. He looks like he does in Rebels, which is cool. I always like that sort of like slender, like red eyed Vader design. It's fun. Um, kind mm-hmm. of based on those like uh, more concept art Vaders from New Hope. Um. And then Vanto gets involved with the Chiss Ascendancy, and that's where the book ends. And I just, ah, man, I'm annoyed. I I'm annoyed. Wish, I'm annoyed. I wasn't a big. I wish fan. we just decided to read the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I was like, here, here was my thing. I was like, okay, well, we're doing, we're doing Tales of the Empire, and we're doing Shadow of the Sith. Okay, well, those are sort of like empirey things. It's about the rise of the Empire and the fall of the Empire. Let's do something about Empire things. So I chose an Empire comic that I knew was a mini series that we could get all done in one thing, and. It was this, and I'm a little sad, and like it's, it's fine. not bad. I have nothing against any of the writers, the layout no. people, the artist, the the people who do color. No, no, no one did anything wrong. Yeah, it's just, <sighs> yeah. Anyway, let's talk about a fucking fantastic book. Oh God, let's talk about this. <laughs> so you chose for us. What is wrong with you? You keep choosing all the best books, and you keep making me look bad here. Um, <laughs> you chose Shadow of the Sith by Adam Christopher. So, so hang on. Let's. I wanna, let's. I want to start this conversation with. So there's the cover. I've already described why I chose the book. There's Luke. There was Lando. There's the promise of the Sith involved. And, I, and the cover just looks phenomenal as a piece mm-hmm. of art, right? Yeah. I'm thrown for a, 
goddamn loop when the first chapter has Ray in it. <laughs> yep. Ray motherfucking whatever her last name is. I <laughs> know. Um, I think here's the thing. I think in general, I just kind of call her Ray Skywalker usually. I mean, like I usually but, go but, Ray but Skywalker. It's weird, but I think it's weird in this context because she is a child still here. Like it's not we're not quite there yet. Anyway, um, whatever. Um, whatever. So my first note actually here is on the opening crawl. Um, because of course, there, you know, there's a crawl in this book that opens the crawl, right? Like telling you the state of the galaxy at the moment, and it's just there's so much here. I didn't know much about this book going in, so I was like, wait, fucking what? Oh yeah, Luke has younglings. Oh yeah, Lando has a has a daughter. Okay, sure. And uh, oh fuck, Exegol. What? Holy shit, what is happening? And then the book actually started, and, the, and then Ray was there. I was like, oh fuck, Ray. God damn it. My notes are insane. At least for like the first page of my notes, it's crawl, younglings, Lando, daughter, Exegol. Oh fuck, that's right, Ray. Ray escaping Palpatine, Sith cult lady, Luke and Ben's dynamic, Luke visions, building the final order, Lady Kira and the Crimson Dawn gets mentioned, Ochi and the Clone Wars, Palpatine enlisting Ochi, Plagueis and Revan call out, what the fuck, Exegol shit, da- Dathan flashback, the Lady Luck is here, Kadara Calrissian, like, my notes are nuts. I <laughs> I can't, I can't, oh god, okay, it's a lot, there's a lot here, and it's exciting, it's really exciting, it's also a thick fucking book, there's a lot right? here. <laughs> um, the, the whole thing yeah. has this great energy, I felt like I just wanted to just keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um and and we did. We did. We just we we both kind of flew this flew through this book. It's um it's pretty great. <laughs> also, um, it's a great like if you're just like if you want great Luke Skywalker content, this book is for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm mean, the great Lando content. Dude. Honestly, I think this is personally like I think probably my favorite like Lando story i've read um read seen whatever I, I i really loved him in this um it was like it was phenomenal i loved i love that it is lando who is coming to terms with a really depressing part of his life like he's lost his kid his kid has been missing for years now mm-hmm. and he's almost on the verge of giving up like just yeah. completely mm-hmm. and then this beautiful, terrible masterpiece falls into his life that gives him new purpose. Yeah. I think it's so easy to every time we fight, we write Lando as a character to be like, he's fun, sly talking Billy D. Williams, sometimes Donald Glover that will swindle you out of some money and whatever. And it's just, it's, I love that. I love Lando. I love him as a character, whatever. But this is such, I, for me at least, I, I thought this was such, such a, a fascinating sort of like introspective look at the character um, and like what actually lies underneath that sort of like smooth talking, beautiful man that Billy D. Williams is. Um, and I, 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 the answer surprised me and, uh, and, and excited me in many, many ways. That was just fantastic. Um, but actually starting to get into some of those notes that I just kind of rattled off there. Yeah. Um, yeah. We 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 get the whole this. So so surprise surprise. This is actually the story of how Ray's parents died. That is that is what this book is. And as far as I understand, my, that, my, as far as I understand that, last... that wasn't anywhere in the premise. I don't think the, the promoted premise. At least. No, um, gosh, not even the backs. Like the back doesn't even seem to indicate that at all. Like nothing yeah. about this seems to indicate this is going to involve Ray in the slightest. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, but no. Do you remember how I chose? Um, what was it Brotherhood? Yeah. Because I read it, it one 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 review on Amazon was like, "Oh, it's the backstory of one throwaway line in Revenge of the uh, yeah, Revenge of the Sith. Sith, yeah, Revenge of the yeah. Sith. Yeah, this is the backstory to a flashback in and like, what was it Rise of Skywalker? Rise, in Rise of Skywalker, and some dialogue that Billy D has in that movie, um, which I didn't realize was there. But also, I strongly suggest everyone go out and watch a little video on YouTube called The Ochi Cut of The Rise of Skywalker. Because <laughs> um, it's pretty much all the context, context you need for this book. And actually, well, here's the thing. You don't even really need that, because this is all this all takes place before that anyway. Um, but man, I, I actually, I probably should have actually rewatched Rise of Skywalker before this. Um, I know I consider doing that, but I didn't have enough time. <laughs> I should have, but at least I watched the Uchi cut at least like five times, um, which is only like a minute and a half long. <laughs> but anyway, I watched it um, a few times as well. So anyway, back to the actual you know, book. We've talked about everything around the book, but not the book. Yeah. Well, so I, I was getting into that. Yeah. So it's, um, 
um yeah it, it's it is the story of how ray's parents died um and the specifically the guy that killed them uh Ochi of bestoon uh ochi is is this um this bounty hunter this sort of bounty hunter he's a hunter well he's met he might not be a bounty hunter now but he used to be a jedi killer yes during the clone wars he used to go after some jedi and i i kind of want to see more of that because we only get like one flashback to that and it involved Depa Balapa and Mace Windu, both of which we know were not killed by Ochi Abestu. <laughs> so, <laughs> so is he like General Grievous? We just know he has reputation, but we just never right, see it. <laughs> right. That's exactly it. Give me, I, I honestly, actually, legitimately, I, I joke. Give me a whole ass Ochi hunting Jedi book. I want that. That's a, actually, you know, what? that's a great comic idea. Give me that, that. is a comic um, idea, not a. That, it a, would be a good book too, but it would be a better comic. Yeah. Um insane anyway um all the while uh there is this sort of a sith cult sort of rising in the background um uh involved with uh exegol and uh and they're sort of like worshiping a palpatine um because palpatine is sort of sort of already back in this or at the very least his, his sort of um his sort of i guess essence lives on on exegol and he's able to like send Which out messages kind of all to people that kind of him. anticipated and do you know yeah exactly yeah because i mean you know once what, here's the thing once you say palpatine's back in rise of skywalker it's not implied like oh yeah he came back from the grave and then just started like going nuts no of course the implication is that he's kind of always still been around he never actually died in the first place i'd, I'd um, almost i'd almost believe that like when his body died on the death star his consciousness went like popped right over to exegol well i mean if if if, if i mean if um if what if what current canon is It's developed. It's strongly implied that that wasn't actually his real body on the Death Star. Um, that was a clone. I would imagine. No, no. I would. I would have. I almost assume at this point that that was a clone. <laughs> yeah, because I because I don't think I I would. Here's the thing. Because so either either the body that died in the Death Star is the clone, or the one that Ray kills in Rise of Skywalker is a clone. And I highly doubt the one in Rise of Skywalker is a clone. So I'm going to say the one in the Death Star was a clone. <laughs> um, but anyway. Um, you know what, actually, um, so having the opening be about Rey, and then by the time we actually got over to, um, Luke training younglings and everything, uh, uh, and seeing Ben Solo, I kind of, like, forgot that, I, I forgot that what I had kind of assumed of this era was that I was gonna see, like, Ben Solo, and maybe Han and Leia, um, or whatever, but I, they, clearly this book wasn't that, um, but what I had thought initially going into this being a, a book that's about like at the halfway point between Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens was I was like, OK, well, we'll see Ben Solo and we'll see like what he what his dynamic with Luke was kind of like. Um, but it wasn't that at all. We only got like one scene really between them. Um, I think there's good... there, there's two scenes. I'd say there's two scenes because there's the one towards the beginning and the one that's, yeah. at the end. the end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you do get a sense of what the relationship is like. Luke is constantly like internally going you know it's tough for him to get rid to disrobe familial relation between us mm -hmm. even luke is like you know it's even hard for me to sometimes not think of him as like not just my nephew but my padawan mm -hmm. yeah and, and it's, stay it's... at my padawan and forget that we're family quite literally mm -hmm. yeah um during all this we actually also meet a character um named lore santeca who is really only really interesting to us as big like higher public readers i guess yeah yeah um, i was like a santeca yes another fucking santeca these bastards are everywhere um <laughs> but no he, he uh he is actually important to um to the book as a whole um but i, I just found it funny that he was even here in the first place um he's part of which... what he's part of one of the first force cho um for, uh, force churches i don't remember which one i think yeah i forget which one um but yeah um uh, let's see, I covered a lot of my things actually in my rattling off there, in my early notes. Um, oh, man. Early, well, um, early, this early, early in this book, it just like, hits you with idea, idea, idea. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, actually, you know, this, okay, this is a scene I actually didn't really delve into in that. Um, so there's actually a really interesting flashback uh, where um, we see uh, Dathan. So Dathan being, um, being Ray's father, and, um, and obviously, I suppose, the... Um, which one is the wait hang on which one is dathan is the actual son of palpatine that's right um yeah, he's the actual like clone son that was raised like boba fett style yeah yeah um 
so we get an actual like flashback of like, of, like him on Exegol. And uh, isn't Ochi there during that time as well? Ochi observes yes, that. Yes, like, right? it's yeah. that, oh, it's that like Vader brought Ochi there because Vader's yeah. like, looking into it or something. Yep, and Dathan was there um, and, 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 and with Palpatine. Okay, that's right, yeah. Um, that, that, I, I found that a re- really interesting flashback. And also makes me curious how aware Vader was of <laughs> Palpatine's larger plan. I can't imagine much, honestly. I, I can't. Can you imagine, can imagine the kind much. of like smokescreen and like deflection palpatine now needs to actively do though before vader decides to just fuck this too early mm-hmm. imagine the imagine if vader did know I, I i don't think he did know but imagine if he did know he's like dying in, in luke's arms he's like dude luke it's not gonna fucking end here you need to go to exegol right fucking now stop that cloning shit immediately he's not dead good god go get him please fuck Ugh. and he dies it's just like <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I imagine for the purposes of that moment, he he didn't know anything. <laughs> it's like Luke. I want to see with my own eyes, and it's like he's trying to plead with Luke with his eyes. <laughs> That's why this he is, took the helmet off. <laughs> it's a fucking conspiracy, man. <laughs> we didn't actually accomplish anything. <laughs> we accomplished shit. It's gonna get worse. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Gotta love that. For the purposes re- that that is not what's happened. <laughs> Yes, um, Vader. I'd love to know what Vader found out there. I'd love to know. Right? Yeah, yeah. Dathan escapes um, on their ship, though. Isn't that what happens? What's up? Doesn't he? Doesn't Dathan escape like on their ship? Yeah, yeah, ex- yeah. He gets like away from. Yeah, because that's how he gets off the planet in the first place, and that's why Palpatine is out to get his um his his clone son killed. Um. So okay. So so I guess like Dathan is a product product of Project Necroman- Necromancer then. I suppose I, I would assume um, so yeah that's interesting then actually that's something i'd like to see delved into anyway totally beside the point um let's talk about fucking anakin's force ghost showing up because what yeah. the hell so I mean, like cool luke, yeah so <laughs> like short version luke goes to another planet to try and meditate on like mm-hmm. he gets goal, attacked he by, by about a, it yeah he gets attacked by the sith cult and um and uh and then after kind of getting his ass his ass handed to him a little bit, um, uh, begins to see the Force Ghost of Anakin Skywalker, um, which I found again another really really interesting scene, and also that's like tellingly like right before Luke is reunited with Lando, and we start putting these characters on. We we set up Luke and Lando in these very very troubled emotional states before they meet each other and go on this journey together, um, which I find mm-hmm. really important. Like we need to like know exactly like why they kind of need each other in this moment right now um really cool i also like hang on a second you'd already decided on this book i like that you chose this book and this is coming actually right off of our dark force rising talk from last episode where we talked about how luke and lando just needed more time together i just realized that go us yeah right like we were we did i did that occurred to me i was reading this book i was like huh luke and lando what a what a it's just a great combo it's it's just it's just a great combo and you can always imagine just Hamill and Billy D just working amazingly together. Um, there are specific scenes I'd love to see in like a movie form that I know I'll never see. Yeah, yeah. Oh God. Anyway, um, so Lando knows about Ochi. Lando is aware of uh of uh what Ochi is up to. Well, sort of what Ochi is up to. He, um, he, he was at a bar and like he overheard Ochi's plan to kidnap a girl and and. Uh, and Lando is like he hears about like Exegol, and Lando's like, "Oh shit, I better tell Luke." Mm-hmm. Um, and in this moment, as we're sort of like catching up on what Luke and Lando have been up to, we learned that like Lando was kind of in this really rough place already post Return of the Jedi, um, and that like everyone kind of got together to kind of help Lando after that, and everyone kind of tried to help him find his daughter Kadara, um, and uh, and it just it, it turned up empty. You know, they they couldn't find her um and uh and that's sort of like where, i like that's where that sort of left off and so luke and Lando are already kind of like on kind of shaky ground meeting each other again like this and like they both kind of see this as that as this moment to sort of make up for that um it's really really cool i really love that um anyway but I lo- uh I, i'm just i'm just gonna say because it's like one of the whole book i love seeing old friends reconnect and figure out how to move forward with where they are now currently mm-hmm. yeah that's great um but yeah so 
Luke and Lando are on the hunt, and oh my god, I love the hunt so much because I love how fucking clip. I love Adam Christopher playing with the idea that Luke and Lando can get really close to finding Ray. And actually, Lando, wait, does Lando straight meet Ray? Lando literally talk to Dathan and Miramir. <laughs> yeah, um, but he never actually meets Ray. That's right. Okay. Um, and also, yeah, like, like, he never learns her name because I was thinking about that later. Yeah, too. No, yeah, he, he can't learn her name. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it, um, and but Luke can never talk to them though either. So it's kind of like in the Clone Wars, always keeping Anakin and Grievous from meeting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's it's fun. They play around a lot with them, uh, how close they can get. Because yeah, they get really close. Um, we have some more encounters with the Sith cult along the way. Luke fights a Sith person himself um, at some point. Um, I I didn't I don't take a lot of notes when I read these things. I I leave that up to you because then it mm-hmm. jogs my memory if I've forgotten something specific. I didn't make a note of um how luke has like identified various like force users like um like dark side force users mm-hmm. and palpatine was like cold and icy i remember him being description his description uh-huh. then i remember because so, we coming off of like again like a like brotherhood a little bit ago now uh his interpretation of like how anakin felt was like the sun dragon mm, yeah oh yes that's right yeah yeah and this new force, this new dark side user, had a very like voiding, had like a feeling of like a void almost. Mm-hmm. If I remember correct, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I always like that description. I think because it's um, I saw it as sort of like uh, I'm trying to think like uh, quite quite literally that like that that th- these like cultists aren't really aren't truly Sith. Like, like that emptiness is sort of because they don't actually, like, they, they, they aren't, like, actual Sith. They aren't, like, actually following it, uh, following the Sith teachings in any sort of, like, meaningful way. Um, right. They're sort of, like, sort of, like, obsessed with the idea of it, it seems. That's how I sort of ran. Um, yeah, that's to- and that totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. Really cool idea. I don't know where this note's coming from. Probably just, I, probably just Ochi's vibe in general. My note here is Ochi, Ochi's Ochi Abyss students horrible, no good, very bad day. Um, which, <laughs> um, which I, I that, think is just like o- Ochi just gets kicked around like all the fucking time. In this. Is that when um, Maximander loses them and then he can't trace them anymore? Maybe something like I, that. It's around I can't that remember. Time frame, I'm sure. Most of the times I re- most of the time I write these notes and I should actually like. Write down the context as to why I wrote them down. Or even a page number. <laughs> right? Yeah. Whatever. Sounds wrong with me. Anyway. <laughs> but also, OG's just kind of OG, OG just kind of gets funny eventually. Like, I, I found him really threatening at first. <clears throat> and like, I don't know. I think that threatening this kind of got away though, the more I uh the more I the more watched. we spent time with him. Or the, the, the more I or the more I read, because like I don't know. <laughs> I think he's I think he just slowly falls into like funny drunk uncle who might slap yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, but then he gets slapped himself instead. <laughs> um, but no, he's just—he's a fun character. I just—I I, found—I remember just finding him really threatening at first. And he has—and he's a fucking sick design. I love him. Um, I know the design indicates he'd be like, like, like a super badass. Mm-hmm. Oh, we never talked about the the kick-ass knife he got that you said you that we can see he was holding in uh, when when he died. Yes, actually, I don't know. So I have the hardcover of Shadow of the Sith. Do you have, you have the paperback though, right? I have the paperback. Yeah. Does the, does the paperback include that awesome artwork of him on the back? Yes. Oh, does, okay. So, so you can see him holding the knife there on that one, right? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I like that, and also it's the obviously it's the same um the same blade from uh, Rise of Skywalker. Um, is the uh, or you know, that's not the blade, is it? No. I'm pretty sure it's Wait. the blade because he was holding. Because when he dies, he's holding it. <laughs> Yes. Oh, yes. Duh. That makes sense. Um. Yeah. So it's the blade. Um. Which is cool. I like that. Not the blade by Charles Salt, which we'll talk be talking about next time. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um. Anyway. Um. Oh man, this is a fucked up note on its own. It just says Lando cries. This is. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. That's another, one, that's another one that I just forget the context for. That's right after horrible, no good, very bad day. Um. Fuck. I can't remember why. What is that referencing? <laughs> I don't know. I know Lando cries. I can't remember why. <laughs> I mean, it's is a, it because he's having a realization about like his daughter? It's gotta it's a, be it's like a, the only it's a, thing. It's a rough journey in general, man. It's 
Oh man, that is also right before though my note here though about that. Uh, there's this great line that um, where uh, Lando and Luke are uh, they're on Nightshade where um where da- Dathan and Miramir are and uh, and Lando is like ushering Luke forward. I, I quoted it here that after you last of the Jedi, fucking hilarious. That's, um, that's such a good line. <laughs> yeah. Um, it is also around here that we, that we meet. Yeah. It's also around here that we meet uh, Kaiza, who's kind of important. Um, that was my worst joke. Um, but Kaiza is is a is a <laughs> Kaiza is our Sith acolyte. Um, uh, for lack former, of a better term, I guess acolyte. I guess a, I guess a former um, one, I suppose. But yeah. Um, well, no, 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 no. Kaiza, Kaiza is the one that currently is the acolyte. Well, I, I'm in, I'm going for the more future tense of everything, but yeah. Kaiza is the Sith acolyte. Yes. Um, and and Wait, meet, who is um, really neat? I like that. That's also really cool. Yeah, yeah. We also have um, uh, Komat's uh, sister, right? Their sisters. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Kaiza's sister, uh, Komat, I think is the one, right? Yes, that's not great. She's <laughs> it's been also, awesome. I, I read this. I'm so sorry. Yeah, she's great. Well, I she's think, fun. I think so, they're. I think they're sisters in the way that like, like, like in like the organizational sense and like the cult they joined, they would be like. Oh, uh, okay. So, yeah, but 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 Komat, Komat was able to to escape from uh, this cult, and Kai's is still very much involved in it. Um, if not but, killed, the rest of them is now the only one left. Yeah. Um. But Komat and Lando help. Kai. Uh, uh. Yeah. Komat and Lando help. Uh. Help Dathan and Miramir sort of escape Nightshade and get to um get to a little place called Jakku. Um. And, uh, and meanwhile, Luke is fighting uh, Kaiza, who is after the mask of Viceroy Exim Panshard. Um, doesn't, doesn't she have the mask? And isn't Luke trying to destroy it? Isn't that what it is? Or, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. She, she's already wearing it. Because that's, that's the one on the cover there, that mask. That's right. Yeah. Um, sorry, she has the mask. She's trying to resurrect pa- uh, Exim Panshard. Um, which, it's Star Wars. Resurrection might not seem as possible as, uh, as, as in maybe some other uh sci-fi fantasy franchises but god damn it works uh <laughs> kaiza, <laughs> right Ka- kaiza dies but then is fucking and this is my favorite plot twist in the whole book kaiza is possessed by the spirit of exim panchard who uses her body to go after luke then what the actual fuck i mean I, I also i also really loved the scene where panchard tortures luke with the visions of the shit he did yeah <laughs> through the oh force it's so good it's so good panchard is another character i want to see a lot more about because as far as i can tell this is like the only thing he's properly appeared in and it's long after his death basically also we didn't mention this for those that haven't read this book and are just kind of listening to it listening to his babble about it it's set up that um that exim panchard is this um this ancient sith uh you know one of the one of the way way past uh rule of two uh sith um was like a viceroy so, yeah. of a planet he was like viceroy and like, panchar or something yeah. panchard yeah um and yeah um it's just he's i, I think he's a cool ass character um <laughs> i would like yeah, to see much i just love how he's he, he he he's puppeting around um thing's body with a droid arm because her arm got fucking sheared off yep oh my god it's absolutely insane absolutely batshit insane plot line here <laughs> um all to distract us from the fact that ochi is still after a kid um ochi actually uh captures uh lando and komat one here's the thing i imagine this whole Sith plot exists actually because if luke were dealing with ochi at bestoon the the ray plot wouldn't even exist so right. we have to the sequel trilogy just... would not happen because he would have found her he probably would have sensed the force sensitivity yeah would have been taken to the and, 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 actually, and actually <laughs> and actually Actually, meeting Dathan then probably would have been able to put a put a stop to Palpatine's plans immediately. <laughs> so, right, like we have to keep Luke away with with this Sith plot, and Lando can't run the book all by himself in reality. Mm-hmm. Well, that's something that I love here is that like it, a lot of this book is about. It, I mean, it's it's got this almost like prequel trilogy vibe of 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 just like this eventual tragedy that you know for a fact has to happen because you know where where it leads eventually. Um, and so it's a matter of just like how close can we actually get to saving the day only for us to ultimately fail in the end um it's really we good fail it's pretty, really and we fail pretty damn hard <laughs> yeah um but then um uh then we have um well luke is able to um just to, to uh rescue lando and come from ochi 
but then um, being confronted then by Panchard and Kaiza, or rather Panchard and Kaiza as one. It's Panchard. Panchard wants Luke to take him to Exegol, um, uh, which he does. He just kind of does. Um, well, they're, they're like on the edge of it because to get in, you need the Wayfinder. Yeah. And yeah. that's a whole um, thing. If you've seen Rise of Skywalker, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, if you then, haven't, uh, why are you here? Yeah. Well, I mean, listening to this discussion it. yeah um uh but then uh let's see oh i forget what the context is, context is for this because it's been a while since i've read it but luke with the lightsaber of darth noctis i have written down oh is that um is that the lightsaber that kaiza has or yeah it's the, it's the one that looks like a that i would love to see that's like curved at the end oh okay yeah i think so yeah you're right um because then what eventually is able to uh, stop Panchard is the breaking of Panchard's mask it stops. I, I guess it reverses whatever resurrection ritual Kaiza performed to bring him back. Um, but then uh, we get, then we get the scene sort of that you've all been waiting for uh, that people who know Rise of Skywalker well have all been waiting for. Or actually, you know, actually, no, this is also literally the scene that we saw way back in Force Awakens of, uh, of Ray being separated from her parents. Um, it is. Yes. <laughs> It started there. Her parents kind of quite literally fleeing from her to keep her safe. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're able to escape, and Ochi's on the ship with them. He he stabs and kills uh, Dathan and Miramir. Um, Ray is given oh beforehand. Ray is given to uh, to Unkar Plut. Who, I didn't know that was that guy's name. That's the guy that that uh, that sort of uh, that that's that stole the Millennium Falcon at some point and and owns it in, Rises, uh, in, in force awakens um i didn't know that guy had a name but hey good for I him. did i i i, I do it's, like star, it's, it's star wars of course he has a name but still i mean no character uh, is nameless no character is nameless in reality except for the nameless who That's actually true. do have name no they have names never mind they, 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 they have names never mind anyway <laughs> for a while they didn't let's be honest though yeah yeah um um but um you know I, I did really like. I did. I did like that in the, in the deal they made, like Dathan and Miramir with him. He's like, she is good for like a season's worth of work. Otherwise, I'm putting her to work if you don't come back. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's cool. I did also love here actually. Um, again, in this uh, this wonderful sort of introspective version of Lando Calrissian that Adam Christopher is portraying here, um, we get a moment of old Lando listening back on the uh, the Calrissian Chronicles, which could have been a really funny moment because, um, you know, it's it's that stupid little, like, hollow book that uh, that Lando is recording in Solo, a Star Wars story, and that's really funny. But no, it's it's genuinely genuinely this great reflective moment of Lando looking back on his life, and um, just really, really cool. I love that. Um, yeah. yeah. And also, I also like where that leads by the end of the book, actually, because um, it's a uh, picks up with Lando like making more of the Calrissian Chronicles. It's it, it's cool. Like it, it just it's it's this idea that you know this this you know Lando's life can still go on. You know he doesn't he doesn't need to stop um because of what's happened to him. It's it's cool. Really really cool. I dig it. Um, and uh... but Lando does go to uh Jakku and sort of uh finds the uh the aftermath of Dathan and, and Miramir's deaths. Um quite literally stuffed in a like a closet and pushed out into space. Yeah, yeah. Um but then uh, he he catches on to the fact that uh, Ochi is going to uh, Pasana, um, which is of course the planet from Rise of Skywalker, where uh, Ochi's remains were found. Um, Ochi is killed by Pasana, is literally what my note says, because it's true. I mean, he's taken in by the sands, and <laughs> um, it's it works. Um, but Luke and Lando part ways. This is actually because this is something weird that I thought. I mean, I get realistically why it would work this way but i thought the structure of the book was kind of thrown off by it that uh luke and lando part ways we get like some moments of like ben like training with the younglings and then like luke um like goes uh luke luke goes with lando to pasana then afterwards i found it weird like i feel like he could, they could have just gone to pasana in the first place I was a well, remember it was that they buried the bodies of ethan and miramir and like an old smuggling tunnel on a planet mm -hmm. that like that's never used anymore yeah and luke looks at oh what's the ex, ex acolyte's name uh <laughs> oh uh it? kaiza 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 he lo luke looks at kaiza and is like can you get this guy some rest i'll pick him back up in like two weeks mm. but he just needs to not just keep going mm -hmm. he needs time to relax yeah 
And uh and yeah, and so then they eventually go to Pasana. I do like that they they search Pasana for a long time. And they don't find they don't find Ochi. But like, look, isn't it written in, in there somewhere that like Pasana is known for like the whole sinking sands thing? They didn't think to look below the sands, like where they eventually find the remains of Ochi in Rise of Skywalker. I it's know. weird. It's a it's a little weird, a little contrived, but otherwise and, and listen, I, think, we, I think it's pretty listen, sad. We, we have to follow the the vi- remember earlier I said visual media always takes precedent. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, we need to follow the visual media dictate of Lando's line of me and Luke looked halfway across the galaxy for him. Yeah, yeah. Important line from the OG Cup. Watch the OG Cup. Um, anyway. Oh, oh, we totally forgot to mention that Dio was in this. And, like, something that I kind of... Ah, I love Dio. Something that I didn't didn't even realize in Rise of Skywalker, mostly because I forgot who Ochi was before I read this book, um, was that uh, Dio, I guess, was was Ochi's droid um, originally. And so that's sort of like how, you know, Lando stays on Pasana, you know, Dio stays with him and all. And, um, and we leave Lando off where, where we find him eventually. And he continues the Calrissian Chronicles. Um, I think that's great. It's, um, it's, it's really, really great. So. My favorite mm-hmm. part, just my favorite part is like sort of a, because it struck me as funny more than anything, is they're on Ochi's ship on, on Pasana. And the force quite literally tells Luke, you're, you're wasting your time. You're too early. Just leave. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, one last thing I actually wanted to talk about before we um before we start to close this out, though, um, is that uh, I want to talk about the beginning beginning of the book because there is um there's a sort of an epigraph right at the start of the the book um that reads uh and in the end you cannot touch the shadow. In the end you do not even want to. In the end the shadow is all you have left because the shadow understands you. The shadow forgives you. The shadow gathers you unto itself. And within your furnace heart, you burn in your own flame. A warning from a darker time, which I looked into because I was fascinated by that. Do you know what that is? I do not. Okay. That is a line from the Revenge of the Sith novelization. Um, That novelization that everybody fucking adores. Um, I didn't realize it had a line like that. Um, Beautiful stuff. But it's referring to, um, uh, to Anakin's relationship with Palpatine. Um, when all is gone, it, Palpatine is the shadow. It is the, it is the one that forgives you. It is, it is the only thing that is left for you. So that is is describing Anakin's mental state when um when giving into the darkness, and I think that's really important here, describing Palpatine literally as the shadow and literally what the title of the book is referring to, Shadow of the Sith. Um, it is that oh. shadow that forgives you and takes you unto itself. Um, but I think it's fucking fascinating, and I love that. And I love this book. I thought it was fucking awesome. Um, this holy book sh- was probably one of the best books we've picked for the for the podcast. You say we? You've picked all the best books. I fucking hate I, you. Uh, okay, I know. <laughs> I Somehow, you Jedi lost. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is good. That was I good. Should, that I was good. I shouldn't rag Duke Jedi Lost. No, I, I picked some absolute legends classics for us to read. Uh, but you know, it, it, whatever. Um, I will say also, you've technically chosen our book for next time, but it's not really an actual choice. Um, we we kind of decided on this together because yeah, this was a mutual. Next decision. time, transition, transition. Um, next time we're doing a a High Republic spectacular on R two B D because currently. And this is hopefully, knock on wood, uh, last of the uh, trilogy of Star Wars shows that are coming out right in a row. Uh, we're talking about the Acolyte next time. And with that, uh, naturally, we're talking about, because you and me have read, I think, literally every High Republic thing to have ever come out. Uh, we're covering books and comics we've already read. Uh, we're talking about um, we're talking about the, uh, the book Light of the Jedi by Charles Soule, uh, an obvious entry point for, um, for, for new High Republic fans. And uh, and the blade by Charles, also by Charles Soule, uh, which is a mini series um, taking place during Phase Two, and also a, a, a still solid entry point um, for new High Republic fans. So it absolutely is. If you've been looking to get into the High Republic, um, I would say any th- of three of those things are good entry points into the High Republic. Uh, Light of the Jedi, the blade, um, uh, the acolyte—they're all acolytes. Also, a good entry into. point. Uh, what's up? Acolyte. I was just I was just agreeing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Acolytes are good, yeah, a good acolyte. entry point as yep. well definitely so we're gonna talk about all those things next time um this isn't like uh like oh yeah we this isn't like how we've been going back and forth like choosing books or anything we just kind of like chose chose this together although i will say you got me into the high republic so i, think I it's, did i it think, was I think, I think you, I think technically like chose light of the it. jedi for us um technically but anyway um but i think that about does it um 
as always, I'll leave uh, links in the description below to um to my link tree and to uh to my brother here's uh, Twitter and check us out there. And um, otherwise, I think I think that about does it. So um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, until next time, this has been Joey Morgan, Jacob. Goodbye. Bye.